So the simple uh, question after this should be, well, Poland perished because they had too much freedom. Or at least their oligarchs had too much free freedom. So let's see what happens when you have a very strong hand. And one of the strongest hands in modern history is Mehmet Ali Pasha, the Hedive. Hedive means viceroy, namesnik of Egypt. As you probably know, look, you know, he lived a long life. This guy was born in Saloniki in Greece. He is ethnically Albanian. Let's go to the next one. And uh, as you also, I hope you know, that Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Egypt. Now, I teach in an Arab country where about one third of my students don't. So when I ask them, you know, who was Napoleon, they say, oh, professor, was he Israeli? I say, why Israeli? Say, well, because he attacked Egypt. <laughs> All right, so Napoleon Bonaparte invades Egypt, and you know what happens next. Uh, the British chase the French out of Egypt. So the French came to Egypt, they showed their force, and their force is, uh, there is a very, lots of great sayings attributed to Napoleon Bonaparte. One of them is that one Egyptian Mamluk, Mamluk are their slave warriors who were brought mostly from the Caucasus, and from the, uh, from the Balkans, one Egyptian Mamluk is always better, you know, beats one French soldier. Two Mamluks are equal three French soldiers. Ten French, uh, French soldiers probably beat ten Mamluks. One hundred French soldiers beat the whole Mamluk army. Why? Because French soldiers have discipline. French soldiers have their cannons, they stand in carré, they have their cannons at the corners of their carré, you know, the square formation. They, uh, they follow the orders. So the Mamluks are splendid but useless feudal army against them. So what happens after the uh, French are chased out of Egypt by the British? There is geopolitical vacuum. There is nobody in Egypt. So the Sultan in Istanbul sends a young officer, Mehmet Ali Pasha, uh, to Egypt to, uh, to bring Egypt back to Turkish order. And this is what he does. The painting is in the Louvre. The news of such massacre was such a big uh, item in France that they actually ended up painting it. And it's a huge painting, you know, it's very popular at the time. So Mehmet Ali Pasha invited all the Mamluks of Egypt, several hundred of them, uh, to present themselves in his palace at a big feast. And during the feast, they sh uh, bolted the doors and they shot all 400 of them. Those who were late arriving were shot later, simply, you know. So this is what in sociology we call the problem of collective action solved. Now it was very clear that there was, there was no need in any consultation with the rest of oligarchic class in Egypt. Who was in charge? Mehmet Ali Pasha. And his children, uh, King Farouk, overthrown by um, free officers in 1952 by Gamal Abdel Nasser and that crowd, was great, great, great grandson of Mehmet Ali Pasha. He founded the new dynasty. What does he do with his uh, uh, newly gained power? That's Egyptian picture. That's, of course, a Russian picture to the right. He starts behaving 100 years later, and this is an important flag. More than 100 years later, he behaves like Peter the Great. He starts building a navy, modern navy, and that navy is uh, created mostly with the French help. Why the French? Because the French are cheaper than the British. The British defeated French in Waterloo in 1815, so the French are eager to regain any position in uh, peripheral countries, so they go to Egypt at relatively moderate price. And Mehmet Ali Pasha orders to build a modern navy. He sets up a modern university. He sets up a printing press. Uh, they translate a lot of uh, updated scientific literature from uh, European languages into Arabic. It's really a modernization. Let me ask you one question. Anybody notices, you know, what's wrong with the Egyptian picture? The ships in Alexandria? The Egyptian painter really wanted to show the glory of Egyptian navy. So what's wrong with it? They are moored to the pier. Under full sails. 
because they are sail ships, you know, they have to have sails, right? Like, if, you know, like children drawing, you know, that if there is a house and it has a chimney, there must be smoke over the chimney. Right. Next one. Yes, so uh, he introduces these governments by uh, uh, kind of a very, very ruthless Saakashvili of his time. You know, so he brings lots of foreigners. And the foreigners give a lot of advice. You know, they love talking to Mehmet Ali Pasha. Uh, and he achieves incredible feats. For instance, when the Wahhabis, you know, we probably need to mention this here, you probably know the Wahhabi sect, pioneered by the Saud al Saud family from Arabia, they captured Mecca. They did trouble already in the beginning of the 19th century. So what happened to them? Mehmet Ali Pasha sent his son, Ibrahim Pasha, with some guns, and they massacred the Al Saud family. And, you know, and Mecca uh, belonged to Egypt since, since then, for another 100 years. So this is his uh, grandson. Look, you know, just take the Fez out, would you ever say that he was not French? All right, they're, they're completely Europeanized by that time. Next one. And look at this. Egypt has railroads ahead of Sweden. 1852, they already have locomotives. Uh, what do they trans uh, transport by locomotive in Egypt? The railroad goes parallel to the Nile River, but the Nile River is slow. Locomotives bring cotton cotton and always cotton to the coast, to Alexandria. They take cotton from all over Egypt and concentrate it in Alexandria. The money which they get from, it's fantastic money. Do you realize how much cotton industrial revolution in Manchester had, uh, how much demand there was in Manchester? Um, the cotton mills of England had to rely on import, uh, imported cotton, obviously. The cotton was coming from either Alabama from, from southern United States, or from India, or from Egypt. To this day, actually, some of the best long uh, uh, filament, uh, long grain cotton comes from Egypt. Right? And the money flooded Egypt to such an extent that they built an opera house. So in Russia, this immediately ry rhymes with Olympic Games, or something like this. So they built an opera house, and what was the first opera you know, that they premiered? You can guess, you know. Aida. They ordered an Egyptian opera from Verdi. Verdi actually refused to come when he learned more about kind of what today we would call the human rights record of the government. You know, but he had accepted the money. Yeah. And the human rights record is all about cotton. Cotton is a horrible agricultural uh, species. Cotton requires about 183 days of hard hand labor a year. You have to you know, go with a uh, hoe, with chapka you know, in the fields. Uh, it's collected by hand. But that's not all. Cotton exhausts soil very badly. Almost nothing can grow for three or four years after cotton in the same field. So peasants hated cotton everywhere in the world. Cotton brings slavery. Why? Because cotton is so labor intensive it makes sense to use cotton with uh, forced labor. This is modernization in reverse, if you wish. You know, this is low technological uh, capacity, uh, low um, profit, low wages, and therefore there must be a lot of labor to produce one big profit for someone to build the Cairo opera. And then what happens with it? Geopolitics intervenes, you know. This is not just the story of economics. Of course, this is the story of geopolitics. The Greeks. Greeks start their rebellion against Ottoman port. We all know this story. We also probably know, you know, the Battle of Navarino. And we always thought that the Battle of Navarino, Russians destroyed the Turkish fleet. Russians destroyed that fleet that Egyptians had built. It was the Egyptian navy, actually. The deal was that Mehmet Ali Pasha, who was kind of capable manager in Ottoman Empire, promised to the Sultan that he would solve the problem with the Greeks. He solved it by massacring the Greeks. You know, massive ethnic cleansing in the island of Crete. And uh, this revolted the European opinion 
There are, of course, you know, again, in the Louvre, there is the famous painting by, I think, David, or one of those, you know, uh, Massacre in Hios. And everybody wanted to go and save the Greeks. Germans, uh, but, you know, British, French Navy, Russian Navy was the first, and the Russian Navy showed its glory. This is, of course, our favorite Armenian painter, Ivazovsky. You know, the, uh, this painting is the Battle of Davarino. This is what happened to the Navy. Let's go to the next one. But what does um, Mehmet Ali Pasha, what does he do after the, he, uh, he loses his Navy? He was a really oriental man. He decided to take the payment for his services anyway, because he did the services. He actually suffered a lot. He lost his favorite Navy. The Sultan, in the moment of despair in 1828, had promised Syria to the uh, Egyptian governor. So he decided to take Syria anyway. He marched on Syria. The Turkish government objected. So there is a civil war between Sultan in Constantinople and one of his own governors. So the governor continues marching, as you probably know this great story. In 1830, he marches all the way to Istanbul. And this is when Russian Empire intervenes to save Turkey, uh, pretty much like Syria today. You know why? Because they figured out that having a weak sultan in Istanbul would be better than having somebody like Mehmet Ali Pasha restoring the Turkish uh, Empire. The British uh, interest was even more commercial. Uh, they wanted a low tariff agreement, free trade with Ottoman Empire. They got it in Baltaliman Treaty. Baltaliman is now part of Istanbul. Uh, from the standpoint, so why did Turkish government uh, agree to such a low um, tariff, totally unprotectionist tariff, on the importation of cloth from Great Britain? Because, uh, I will try to, to get this in English, you know, but first I'll say in Russian, you, know, you probably will understand. Решили кинуть подлянку. You know, to, uh, so they decided to frame uh, the governor of Egypt, because he was trying, you know, next, after cotton, he decided to build factories, he decided to build uh, industry uh, producing cotton cloth. Logical, right? No. From the British standpoint, this was bad. This was competition. And from the standpoint of the Sultan in Istanbul, you know, this guy, when he builds uh, his factories, will become too important, or too self-important. Let him compete against the British. Let him lose. So this was actually a typical kind of oriental question diplomacy of the time. Let's go next. So what happens? They need to borrow money. But they still, you know, Egypt is an amazing story. You know. They are still kicking, you know, 1860s, and they are still pursuing their modernization project. Mehmet Ali Pasha uh, died from old age and senility. He went quite crazy in his last two years. But still, in the 1860s, Egypt builds the Suez Canal. Do you realize the importance of Suez Canal? It cuts in half the travel time from Europe to uh, India. The most important canal for British Empire. And the Brits did not have part of it. It was French and Egyptian affair. Of course, the British did not like it at all. So what happens in, during the 1860s, of course, uh, Egypt enjoys absolutely incredible prices on its cotton exports because Alabama is out of the picture. Alabama is engulfed in civil war, in the American Civil War. So what happens at this time? Egypt gets, well, pretty much, you know, the high oil prices like Saudi Arabia and Russia in the last 10 years. And then comes the crush. Then uh, American Civil War is resolved and all that cotton and cotton, unfortunately, can sit in the warehouses for several years. All that cotton which was harvested during the Civil War but could not be exported, suddenly in one burst is exported in the world market and the prices collapse. 1873, Egypt is in default. They cannot finance their foreign debt. And international companies you know, come and say, well, you can, of course, pay with the Suez Canal. He refuses. Well, uh, this is Ibrahim Pasha already, you know, he, uh, Egyptian government refuses, but eventually they have to accept they're broke. Because they're broke, you know, they imposed what today International Monetary Fund would, uh, would call uh, structural adjustment. 
they tell Egyptians, you know, that you cannot have such a big army as you do. The army must be uh, cut in four times, quartered. And of course, you know, it's very difficult to tell the army that they are, they are going to be unemployed starting tomorrow. Um, Colonel Urabi raises rebellion against the British. This is the first Arab nationalist rebellion. And in order to stop Colonel Urabi, the British send gunboats to Egypt. Show the next one. This picture is actual photograph of what happened to Alexandria. You know. uh, remember all these beautiful palaces that they built, and you very European like Alexandria. It's a Mediterranean city. Europeans were very impressed at the time because they haven't seen Stalingrad yet. You know, it would be still you know, another two generations ahead. You know, this is one of the first times that photographs could carry to Europeans also the, uh, the extent of damage that modern weapons could inflict. So this was after three days of bombardment. Uh, the king of Egypt was hiding aboard the British ship. Colonel Urabi finally was defeated, captured, was sent and spent 20 years in prison in Ceylon by the British. And Egypt, the next one, yeah, one of the great stories, you know, Lord Salisbury, the foreign secretary of Great Britain, said that Britain did not conquer Egypt. Britain actually insisted that Egypt continued to be part of Turkish Ottoman Empire until 1914. It was kind of very diplomatic fiction. While Egypt was actually ruled by the British from the British Embassy. So this is the famous maxim of Lord Salisbury, we do not govern Brit uh, Egypt, we govern the governors only. And so this is indirect rule. Next one. Yeah. So what happened, this is the summary of Polish. Uh, Poland became exporter of uh, raw commodities. And uh, these raw commodities were exchanged for very simple luxuries for the oligarchic elite of Poland. Poland lost out you know, the, on uh, modern technological innovation in military race, you know, arms race. The next one. What happened in Egypt? Pretty much the same story. Again, you know, whatever you do, you know, kudani clean, sudo clean. Uh, whatever you do, what happens is that you are still commodity producer. Egypt had a navy. They had railroads, you know, so they did almost everything but bad luck. This is already 19th century. Russians were very lucky. They were much earlier. Uh, Britain was not yet a big power in, in the times of Peter the Great. 19th century Britain is already uh, the, the problem of timing, as we would call it in political science. Timing is wrong. And the place is wrong. Egypt is way too important to British Empire. They could not allow uh, someone else to control the Suez Canal. 